evening. I am Beth Messenger and I'm a library assistant here at the Independence Public Library. So this year is the 150th anniversary of what came to be known as the Great Fire of 1874. Local historian Judy Olson will be providing us with some details of the events that unfolded and the aftermath that led to the architectural beauty and continuity of our downtown district today. Let's welcome Ms. Judy. I haven't seen here before. So for some of you, there might be a little bit of a review, but for others, all new information maybe, or just refreshing what you know. Um, yes, it is the 150th anniversary of the Great Fire of 1874, and I could not let this go past without commemorating the event. It actually happened on the night of May 25th, is that, or we morning hours of May 25th, as that says. So um, I actually got interested in this through the underground tour that we do. I had started doing research to help fill out the story behind that, and in the process started getting interested in what was above ground and why we had such beautiful architecture downtown, and I learned about this fire. And the more I read, the more I was amazed at how um, not people came back from this disastrous event, and I, since then I've started telling the story in multiple ways. So um, hopefully you'll learn a few things, um, and hopefully um, you can follow along pretty well. Um, I will say it's thanks to the Buchanan County Genealogical Society archives that we are able to have this information. And we are a nonprofit or a branch of the Historical Society. Um, we are looking toward digitizing our collection, um, so any donations are always welcome. <laughs> okay, that's my only pitch. So we're going to start with the maps that you have copies of. And this actually, I think, was printed shortly after the fire in the Buchanan County Bulletin, but it was reprinted later. Uh, we don't have a copy of that, but it was reprinted later in 1900 and then has been used a lot since. So thankfully, somebody took, well, some newspaper men took it upon themselves to create this diagram. So uh, I just want you to get oriented, because I know as I talk, you're going to be wanting to look at that. North is the top of the paper. And here along the bottom, you see Main Street, or First Street East. So this is the main block right down before we get to the river. I've marked a couple of landmarks now. We have colored vine there, the Gedney. And this is what locals still know as Chatham, but is actually 2nd Avenue Northeast. So that runs north-south. So that's the T intersection of the downtown where we have the stoplights. Um, up here at the top is Dupaco, Crowbar Parking now. But everything else that's on the map, and the actual typeface, is what was printed way back when. So Malik Theater is here now with the alley. Over here, these four storefronts actually make up the Living Water Church, which um, is downtown. Okay, so that gives you a little orientation of that side of the map. Now looking at the other side of the map, this is south of Main Street. So we still have North at the top of the map. That's Main Street or First Street East. Same block, the river's over here, but where we have that continuous row of buildings. And I marked Chone Garden is right there. Mini Frank, Eschens. For those who are local, you'll know these are some of the, the stores. And of course, Northeast Security Bank is there. This was called Walnut at the time, so if you hear me use the word walnut, I kind of go back and forth. That's 3rd Avenue Southeast. And at that time, there was an alley behind all of those buildings. And on the south side of the uh, block were four residences, some livery stables and the German Presbyterian Church. Okay, so that helps you get a little bit oriented as I start talking about all of this. 
Um, first thing I'm going to go through is just kind of give you a frame of reference as well as to what independence was like then. It was a town of 3,000 people. Um, we are looking at 1874, so it's nine years after the Civil War, which um, Buchanan County was very involved in, sent a lot of volunteer soldiers to fight. Um, and um, it's in a boom time. Things are really building. So this was one of the first buildings that came up after the war. Uh, they started in 1867, actually finished in 1870. That's our big mill. Tom, Thomas Sherwood, no, not Samuel Sherwood did that one. Another pretty uh, outstanding building was the first National Bank building. This was on the Bank Iowa corner. And um, it was obviously substantial, made of limestone, finished in 1872. We had one other bank in town, which was down on the corner where the Getty Bakery is now, called the Buchanan County National Bank. So there were, you know, we were pretty established in that regard. We had just finished building the Iowa Hospital for the Insane. Um, 1873, and um, maybe not all of them, but certainly the main buildings, the central buildings were there, fully complete, they've added on since then, but honestly I do think that was what they had finished at that time. So that was quite an achievement, I mean, and that was drawing medical people into town, people who had, you know, family members there, all kinds of stuff. Um, and this was the pride and joy at that moment in time, in the fall of 1873, this building had just been completed. Now, it's called the Wilcox Block because there was a man named Phineas Wilcox who was one of the early settlers. And he was, uh, he was a dry goods merchant, um, but he was quite the entrepreneur in developing the town and he acquired a bunch of property and that sort of thing. Um, he had died, unfortunately, before he saw all of the, his vision come to fruition. But his estate continued to develop the downtown, and this is, if you look at your map, the diagram side, nope, the other side, um, this is uh, in that, that south block. Um, so it's six storefronts here, along the front, it's actually three stories high, and it was not the only three-story tall building in town. There were several others. Notice the cupola at the top. That's an indication of the opera hall that was behind. Interestingly, the, they had four storefronts, then on the second floor were offices. Down here at the very end was where our brand new public library was located because we, in the fall of 1873, became the very first public library in the state of Iowa. And that's where they located it, in that area. And then the third floor was given over to the Masonic Lodge and the Fireman's Hall. The, Maso the Masons were pretty well to do. They really had their lodge rooms fitted out beautifully. Behind all that, on the second and third floor, were two very large rooms, one of them being a ballroom, and the other was to be the opera house. Um, so this was an incredible building. And, um, it was described in great detail in several news articles. Um, other very well-established buildings in town. This one is on Chatham, or this is the Dupaco Corner here. So this is the St. James Hotel, a three-story brick building. And next to it, this was all part of what was then called the Burr Block, owned by one man, and he had four storefronts. Notice there are balconies. Um, you know, these were nice buildings. Another one was this one, um, Herrick and Sherwood Jewelry, or also known as the Bazaar. And then it also had Oak Hall. So it's got two storefronts here, the jewelry, three floors. And this was an older opera house, much smaller, which was being replaced by the, the big Wilcox block but that one is there. Today it's um, plush and total image. There's a view, kind of looking down the street. This actually was at another hotel that was be, um, beyond, it would be off the map, but you can see the mill there. Uh, this is what they called the Munson building, or Munson block downtown, three-story brick. 
and here's your corner for the bank. Looking down the streets, of course, were mud, <laughs> dirt, which they had to try and take care of. And here's another view, unfortunately. These are taken from a lot of them from stereo optical slides and try to get the best we can. But you can see we have also a brand new bridge, which was built in 1872. And that part of that is down with the Iron Bridge access on the Watsi now. And uh, you can see the cupola of the Wilcox block there. And then, of course, the other thing going into 1874 is that the town had already experienced one devastating fire. The fire of 1873 that happened uh, right after Thanksgiving Day, and it burned out the block. Um, if you look at your diagram, it will show you there were in, um, 10 or 11 businesses that were burned out at that time. Um, so the town had already had a bad experience. So this is the full circle corner, or what was the Harding Drug corner, burned all the way up to what then was a, uh, about Napa, about where Napa is. Um, and uh, the cost of that one, what did I have? Nearly $800,000 in losses in terms of our money today. So um, because of that, the city council had started talking about, we really need to get some firefighting equipment. Um, because they really were ill-prepared for that. Fortunately, they had been able to pull a building down and they managed to stop that fire from being any worse than it was. But they had quite a bit of experience with it already and the potential of more fire because there were a lot of old frame buildings downtown. Um, they were buildings that had no firewalls between them. There was just, uh, it's, it was not a necessarily safe building structures at that time. So, um, oops. What we had for firefighting at that point in time, we had two volunteer brigades, the Hook and Ladder Company and the Cataract Company. Um, they really didn't call themselves that, but they had, they were in charge of the Cataract hand pump engine. That's pretty much all they had during the 1873 fire to fight um, fire. So you had to get out, um, connect water to it. It was all done by hand. In fact, I've got a picture here of a guy with it. Mm -hmm. That's what was available. And they did have separate hose carts to go with it to try to um, you know, reach the fires. Um, but because of that fire, the city had purchased a Platt and Jones steam fire engine. Um, so this was pretty much state of the art at the time for firefighting. It had gauges and valves on it that would control the water pressure, control the steam. Um, it could really put, push some water through the hoses then, and it was going to be a great thing. And it arrived in town just a couple of days before the fire of 1874. The downside was it had not been assembled. And they had no training. <laughs> so there we have some great firefighting equipment, but who knows what we're, what we're going to do with this. They actually did have one other engine that they had gotten in between. It was called an Amos Keg engine, and I, I couldn't really find a good picture of that. Um, but it was over on the west side of the river where they had been trying to get it to work properly. And, and anyway, so it wasn't on, on the east side. Okay, so we are back. So if you think about this, the fire, it's, it's the wee hours of the morning. The fire actually started about 1.40 a.m., they think. But the alarm did not go out until 2 a.m. The reason being, they were trying to rescue the people in the spot where it started. So it starts, oops, wrong way, did the wrong thing. Um, it started, I have it on your map, the origin of the fire. This was in a millinery shop. Mrs. Brown was a milliner, and she and her family lived in the back of the shop on the main floor. And the second floor was occupied by a family called the Holtz. And um, it was a wooden building. It was um, so it, you know, and it was only, it was just the two stories. That's the back of the Living Water Church then now, except of course the building is a different building. But 
that is where it started. And I really don't know exactly what caused it. You know, there was a lot of speculation, uh, but by the time they discovered it, basically the Browns got out with the clothes on their back. They escaped. Um, the Holtz also got out, but the access, access to the second floors was all by outside stairways, which we still have. So um, they had to throw a mattress out the window. It had been, it was burning, so it was blocked off. They had to throw a mattress out the window, throw the baby out, all jump, and fortunately, other than a sprained ankle, the whole family got out. So that was the first thing. The volunteers had shown up. They were rescuing them, and they also started trying to pull down these wooden buildings that were small shops in between. And then, finally, the fire bell started ringing. Can you imagine, in the middle of the night, the clang, clang, clang for the whole town. It'd be like getting a tornado siren <laughs> in the middle of the night now. Um, and everybody started flooding out to the downtown, especially in light of what had happened just six months earlier. So fortunately, as it first started, there wasn't a lot of wind. However, because these two buildings here were wooden, and um, Lake Hayward fire chief told me, yeah, the wood will uh, would catch fire slower. It would be slower to catch fire, but once it did, it burned really hot. And that's what happened. So it started, this was our three-story block building and it went up through the windows into the third floor because the fire was so intense. So the fire then started moving to the north. And at the same time, as the fire intensified, it created its own wind, plus the wind picked up. So now we suddenly have more wind, and it's just starting to burn like crazy. Um, this is where we have a theme for our parade this year, Carl, called Heroes Among Us. And there was the hero among us that day. His name was Dick Guernsey. He went by DeWitt when he was a boy. He uh, came to Iowa or to Buchanan County in the 1850s with his family from New York. And uh, they opened a sawmill. They actually had a sawmill just north of where the mill is now. Uh, and were very skilled in carpentry and all that. Well, on top of it, Dick Guernsey became the mechanic for MHI, or for the insane, the hospital for the insane. So he understood the workings of steam and, and all the different mechanical parts of that. And he said, we've got this steam engine. We're, we're not gonna let it sit. He got a crew of guys, they hauled it down to the river behind, behind um, where, you look at your map, okay, I forgot to throw a map in here. Behind where the St. James Hotel is. And they started running water up from the river and heating it with no controls. So he was in total risk of his life in terms of managing how much pressure it easily could have blown. He could have been scorched by steaming water. But he and his crew worked it. And because of that, they, they tried to bring this under control. That wasn't happening. Next thing, they moved it up to the Dupaco corner, or the St. James Hotel corner, and they started putting water over the Benton's lumber yard, which was just across the street. Now you can imagine, had that lumber yard caught fire, that would have been the end of that block, and who knows what else. So that was a major achievement, at least in stopping the fire in that direction. Meanwhile, however, it's continuing to go south. Yeah, I do have that back there. It's continuing to go south from there, and this particular block was all wood, really old wood buildings. Once it caught fire, it was super, uh, very, very intense um, heat. Oh, actually, I was going to read you a portion here. Because this, sometimes their wording is so good. This is uh, back to describing Dick Guernsey. When the fire began to assume formidable proportions, it occurred to our competent engineer and machinist, Dick Guernsey, that this machine was not fulfilling its destiny, 
lying idle in the engine house. So, with the assistance of some of the crowd, he took it to the river in the rear of the bird block, built its boiler by means of a garden pump, lighted the fire, attached the hose, and ran the steamer to her utmost capacity during the remainder of the night, doing most efficient service. When it is known that the engine had neither steam or water gauges attached and was operated by Mr. Guernsey entirely without means to indicate the pressure or state of the water in the boiler and at imminent risk of his life, the heroism of the act will be realized. So that's from the newspaper. So meanwhile, yes, next thing, this block is just under intense fire. And um, that is what about when they thought, well, maybe we'll try and bring the Amos Cake engine over from the west side of the river. Sent Clarence Fonda, the son of one of the dry goods merchants, over with a team of horses so they could haul it back. But by the time he got, he got everything together, the fire was raging too hot right here. Uh, so he could, they couldn't bring it over. However, Clarence came roaring back on one of the horses to give word, and that really is the only injury that took place during this fire, which is amazing. He and the horse got pretty well scorched because by that time, it was starting to cross. It had crossed over to the Wilcox block. So we're looking at that again. This is the building that they thought would never burn in this fire. Brick, three stories, separated, but it, it, um, it still caught fire. Now, the interesting things here, I learned this more recently. Guernsey wrote memoirs about his life experiences, and one of them included how the Wilcox block caught fire. At this point in time, people have been hauling goods out as well, and there's goods on the bridge, sadly, catching fire now. People are hauling goods out the back of these buildings, trying to save them, just in case the fire goes over. And then as the windows break in the front, you start to have a wind tunnel. But Guernsey pointed this out as well. P.C. Wilcox built the Wilcox Opera House where the low Brad buildings once stood. Just, okay, sorry. His opera house had a wonder cupola, which extended some distance above the buildings. The cupola was the direct means of the burning of the south side of Main Street in the Great Fire of 1874. I saw the fire go over the buildings without doing much damage, the hot gases passing above. But finally, the flames caught in the cupola and burned down and out at the back of the building and then east to the Montour House, which is where the security bank is. The rear was on fire long before the fronts of the building were scorched. The old cataract hand engine did good work in the rear of the block until the fire came through from above. When the boys had to flee for their lives, they lost some lengths of fire hose but saved the engine by running it into the river. So, uh, and when I was talking again to Blake Hayward about this, he said, yes, when I had done this presentation, he said, when we saw that cupola, he said, that was bad idea architecturally in terms of firefighting. But once that caught fire, and then it's drawing more fire and heat up through the building. And then it mentioned burning along the back side. Well, the back side of the building had um, all these sheds and storage areas behind it, which aren't shown in the drawing. But oops, there it is. all along here. So it started burning faster. Here's your Wilcox block. And they did think this three, this brick wall might hold it, but that still didn't work. Our, our plane had a three-story building. Even so, those were catching fire, and then the fire was burning along the back side of the, the block with the sheds slower along the front. But and there was a tremendous amount of heat there again that was causing you know, some damage across the street. Um, some other interesting things that happened there, let's see. After this, okay, after this block caught, the Wilcox Cox block caught, there was no attempt to stay the flames on Main Street as the fire was beyond the prospects of control in that direction. Building after building now succumbed 
and the fire went on in its mad race to the east and south. The roar of the elements and the crash of falling walls became terrific. The flames shot higher and surged forward in, de in demonic fury, carrying all before them. It reminded us of the great Chicago fire, which seemed a hell on earth. Plains three-story building, Fisher's two-story brick, and Swartz's two-story brick soon fell, and the handsome opera house was on fire. And they do give a blow by blow in the paper of it, marching down the street, taking building by building. Um, so meanwhile, well, one other thing, we have Osgood's music and millinery store here on the end, which wasn't part of the Wilcox block. Well, he, <laughs> uh, Osgood didn't waste any time. He was trying to get organs and pianos out of his building. He moved them behind thinking that they would be safe there, but ultimately had to push them into the river and then do salvage later um, because there was, you know, there was, he at least didn't save them. <laughs> but, and we talk about the cataract hand engine. They had to move that down to the river. Meanwhile, this block is starting, well, started burning. And soon we're losing the German Presbyterian Church brick building there. Four residences. They got the animals out of the livery stable, but the livery stables were burning. Everything here was on fire. Then, of course, the block south of there started to be at risk. And it was individuals, a man named Donnan, who organized some of the neighbors there, got up on the roof, started a bucket brigade, and they just started dousing the roofs to try to keep them from starting fire, which they were successful in that. In the process, he found three powder, or three kegs of powder as well, which fortunately he discovered and threw into the river. <laughs> Otherwise, who knows where this town would be. So, so those were another act of heroism there. Okay, but meanwhile then, what are we doing over here on Walnut or 3rd Avenue? Um, it's jumped that street. We're afraid that it will jump over to the next block. So at that point, Guernsey and his crew, again, moved the Clapp and Jones steam engine up to a cistern that was located at this corner. It was a public well or public cistern for water. And they started pumping from that and just keeping the far side of the street wet. They weren't even trying to fight the fire here at this point. So here we are, 6 a.m., four hours late since the fire call went out. And finally, finally, the fire is dying down. <laughs> and um, yeah, I just try to envision that. I can hardly imagine how that must have looked. So there's summary. Lost were 39 businesses, two hotels, two newspapers, a church, four residences, two livery stables, but no loss of life. So compared to the Chicago fire, which was very fresh in people's memory since it was in 1871, um, we lost more per capita financially, but there were over 700 lives lost in the Chicago fire. So in ways, the town considered that There's a financial comparison. Um, they gave figures, $560,000 in losses in, of $240,000 of an insured. That's in their values, as you can see, in our values, $15,400,000 in losses with $6,600,000 insured. So, pretty huge um, hit to the town. Take a look here. These are some of the views after the fire. What we have here, you remember the bridge. So we're up on the mill, the top of the mill. The bridge survived. There's nothing here. This is the steeple of what was then the Methodist Episcopalian Church. And this is the Baptist Church. This was a school building. You can see all of those now. You wouldn't have been able to see them before the Wilcox block. There's a few walls left in here, but not much. This is from the other angle. Um, 
from the Baptist church steeple that I pointed out. So those of you who know Bill Lake, that's his office corner right down there with Trendy Tulip over here. These are the remains of the walls. So there is one wall there from the Wilcox lot that still stands up fairly high, but the brick buildings, nothing here where the residences were. And of course, we can see the mill over there with the bridge. That the entire block on. Looks like there are a few people standing down there as well. So this is the ruins of the Wilcox lot. Um, obviously, a lot of rubble came down into the street. Um, Tony Banks and I were debating about whether that was the front or the back, but we decided it is the front because the windows are very similar in shape to the way they were on the front. Um, but that's all that was left of that beautiful building. And this would be, right next to it, our, our plane. He had a hardware store, three-story building. That's what he had left. This was rubble from behind another hardware um, store. Interesting story there is they, um, their safe got buried by tar paper, um, stuff that was in the storage area. And when they dug it out, the handle was melted. They had to crack it open, but amazingly, everything inside was okay. This was also true for the Buchanan County National Bank. When they got to their safe, everything inside was okay. So good advertisement for that safe <laughs> So there we are. And um, literally, you just think, where do you start? We have already had this one other block burned out. There's really just not much left. And there's kind of a gasp there. But one of the key things here was they had lost everything. The presses were gone. There were two of them, the Conservative and the Buchanan County Bulletin. Both of them headed right to Chicago that very same day, uh, worked with pressmen, printers that they knew there, got printers for back within 24 hours and setting up and started printing the news so people would know what was going on and to encourage people. So that was a huge, contribution from the newspapers. Um, the things that we had going for us in terms of rebuilding is the fact that we had so many craftsmen, carpenters, masons here from having not so long ago completed the mill, the Wilcox block, the um, hospital for the insane. We had quite a collection of people who could knew what to do. We also had lumber yards, brick yards, um, limestone quarries. We had materials there. The, there was no such thing as FEMA. There was nobody who was going to come help bail us out. And in fact, um, it was the beginning of what they called the Long Depression. So money was tight with banks, plus the Chicago fire had uh, taken a lot of resources. So we were a little bit on our own for this. The Grange Associations, which are basically the agricultural uh, societies that were out um, in the countryside, started contributing money because, yeah, they needed independence. This was the hub for all the shipping in and out and all the supplies that they needed. Um, people who had outstanding bills came and paid them, even though, you know, they didn't have a whole lot of you know, way to keep track of that anymore. They had no record of what was owed, but people came and settled their bills. Um, and um, yeah, so people just really started pulling together. Meanwhile, for those who had managed to save some of their merchandise, shop, other shop um, owners opened up their doors to them. So anywhere there was a building in a block that hadn't been burned out, they were making room for them so they could keep doing business, bringing an income, which would help them rebuild. Um, and then one really cool thing that happened, um, June 12th, W.W. Cole's circus was scheduled to come to town already. Um, and he was a native son of independence. He became a big name in circuses later, and, uh, but he decided he came to town and donated a portion of the proceeds and made it very easy for anyone who had suffered losses in the fire to just come. So, so that was uh, an extra sideline that was kind of a cool thing. Now, um, so 
some things that were not so great. Miguel Foundry, which was um, ca for cast iron, for all that kind of thing, um, burned within two days. <laughs> they had a fire, but they don't know what happened. So they started rebuilding too, so they could provide a lot of the cast iron ornamentation that later went into the buildings. But the other thing that happened was a hurricane. <laughs> it's like, um, yes, June 7th, not that, but it was about a week after that. Um, I really think this was a derecho. They didn't quite know what to call it. They didn't call it a tornado. It was straight line wind, and it was a very narrow path, came right over Independence, did not touch Jessup, did not touch Winthrop. However, Raleigh and Kwaski got hit pretty good. Um, and various places out in the countryside here, Methodist Episcopal Church, which had survived the fire, <coughs> lost its fire. Uh, there was roof damage to the First National Bank. <coughs> all of the things downtown that had not been hit had some damage done. And um, yeah, so this was a quote that appeared in the paper after that. <laughs> showing to have a sense of humor despite all. Having, within two weeks, experienced a disastrous fire and a hurricane, <laughs> our people are discussing the probable chances of the next dispensation as between a flood and an earthquake. <laughs> Just now, the chances seem to incline to the flood. <laughs> so, yeah. They gotta, gotta laugh once in a while. Okay, so, but the things also that happen, we have these craftsmen. We also had a man named Amos Blood, who had been the man who had designed the great Wilcox block. And um, rather than rebuilding one big block like that, the Wilcox estate decided to divide up the property and sell the lots individually. And um, so lots of people, lots of merchants, were able to buy their own lots and build their own buildings now, Amos Blood being one of them. <coughs> And he had used that Italianate style that we saw in the Wilcox block. And I forgot to talk about that, but I, whoops, what happened here? Oh, yes, it did. Um, I forgot to talk about the Italianate style, but we'll look at it a little bit more here. Uh, so he kind of set a standard there with his building. And actually, the Watsi Wares, um, where that used to be, um, was his building. And it still has quite a bit of more. Well, they're all ornamental, but um, he had a lot of ornamentation on his building. Um, and others began adopting that Italianate style as they rebuilt. Um, Plain was one of the first to get out there. He owned the lot and the building already. That was his whole livelihood. So Unger was another one. He had no insurance. So that building is the one that Color Divine and um, the Allerton are in now. And actually, if you look at it, it's not as highly decorated as some of the others because he was doing it all out of his own pocket. But he did start digging in. He was a Civil War veteran, and there was no waiting around for him. Um, by the end of October, six storefronts on Chatham had been rebuilt. And we had Unger. That's the only bit on that one north block that had burned so hot. But on the south side, there were 17 storefronts that had been reconstructed. We're talking four to five months. And seven storefronts on the north side where the, the 1873 fire had been. So it's pretty amazing what they managed to achieve in that county. Yeah, from, well, it's the end of May. So we've got June, July, August, September. October is when they moved in. just goes to show kind of the team of builders that we had. So here, um, these aren't from directly after the fire, but they give you an idea. Actually, they're installing gas pipe here in this one. The, the library, which lost everything, except the books that were checked out, <laughs> had to regroup, um, and they brought it back in, and more money was donated to add to the collection again, and it actually became part of the Morse Tabor block. It was often, uh, it seemed to be the way that a couple of merchants would team together and they build their building so it looked like one unified block. And then there'd be another block of two buildings. So that tended to be what would happen. 
there it is. And they had that cornice piece there. Free Public Library, 1874 now, because we it burned down. And this is what they call Morse, W.H.H. Morse and Tabor and Son. So he was a dry goods merchant and he was a drug, uh, that was a drug store. And then we have Plains Hardware right there. And you see the Italian, this is what I'm talking about too, this ornamentation. And because of our foundry, we were able to have a lot of the ornamentation done in cast iron, which made it last a long time. This is, um, that just shows you the months of love to the bank, the part that had survived. This building is no longer here, that one's no longer here. But. South side, another view. This is looking toward the mill. So here, this would be about, um, so this is the empty building where Circle 8 Cyclery was. So here, this would be a total image flush. The ornamentation and notice, uh, you know, they did paint the bricks on back then too. There's two different things. This is looking straight down from Chatham at that T intersection. And then this would be the block that burned in 1873 when it was rebuilt. One thing that did change dramatically was that we had two story buildings instead of three story buildings, much less expensive to build. So we had to recuperate. We still have a few three-story buildings, but not as many as we would have had if we hadn't had that fire. So was that Harding Drugs building there then? Yep, yeah, that's the last picture. That's yeah, okay. that's the Harding Drug corner. Early 1900s. So the chimneys you see behind it are part of the Gedney Hotel and all that. Now you probably won't be able to see this that great from a distance. I did my best to try to create a map <laughs> in uh, Excel that would kind of show the rebuilding process. So this map is oriented differently than your map. You can see I've got this for Main Street, and here's Chatham. It was just easier to put it all on that way. But anything you see in the light blue is what was rebuilt by October 1874. So this whole block here, the Unger block, like we said, that's the only one that was in the north block. But all along here, I made one mistake. This one wasn't rebuilt until 1875, so we did have one gap there. And then all of this was rebuilt in 1874. That is really impressive. And it does explain why our downtown The green went up in 1875, so these people, they just had to you know, work out their finances a little bit more, or 1876, they made those the same. Then we had a little gap in building, and it was 1880 when finally some of the um, owners were kind of pushed <laughs> to do something about their vacant lots, partly because we're like down here, the water started standing in the pits and you know it wasn't safe. So uh, down here this was rebuilt up in 1880 and they had hoped to put a hotel there but the man Purdy who owned it uh, wasn't getting enough support so ultimately he sold these two lots to two other people and became four storefronts with a bank on the corner. Um, this was built later because of a fire that happened and then up here this, this was a major thing in 1880 and 81. Those two gaps were finally filled with, um, with buildings. The ones in yellow are just buildings that were replaced um, and then upgraded to look better so they would match our downtown. Those happened in the 90s because of Rush Park and the racing and everybody wanted the town to look really good. So that was my effort to try to <laughs> give you a visual of that. Um, one other outcome of the, um, the fire, of course, was independents decided we better have a fire department. <laughs> and so they started um, organizing that. Actually, the Hook and Ladder Company took charge of the Clapp and Jones steam engine and renamed themselves Independence Fire 
company number one, and the cataract company became company number two. And so then they became much more official firefighters, whereas before it was just all volunteer uh, men who were willing to, to get out there and try and keep the town from burning. This was taken much later. It's on the uh, Bank Iowa corner where First National Bank was at the time. So, so here we have it. We have a town that was rebuilt. And what I think is the particularly, um, serendipitous. Uh, here we are 150 years since then and we've had our own kind of rejuvenation of the downtown now. So 150 years later we, we've uh, brought back to life and done those beautiful facades that we had. I like this. I thought it was very good in closing. There is no town in Iowa whose business or main street presents a better or handsomer than does independence. As one stands upon the iron bridge spanning the Wapsie and looks eastward up Main Street, it presents for quite a distance and on both sides of the street an almost unbroken front of solid brick and glass and of uniform beauty. When we take into consideration that it is now less than two years since nearly the whole business portion was a blackened mass of ruins, the transformation is indeed remarkable and must be an index of the indomitable will, energy, and pluck of the citizens who have raised independence from ashes to one of the finest looking towns in Iowa. So that was the Cedar Falls Reporter, that, and that was reprinted in Recan County Bulletin, September 1st, 1876. I think it could even apply to today. <laughs> yeah. So are there any questions? <laughs> Again, they are not really sure. That one started in a wood, what they call the woodshed, a chair woodshed behind a saloon and a store. Um, and they don't really know what happened. Late at night, uh, again, got started, and the intensity of the fire made it reach up through third story will, uh, windows again. And, and once that happened, it was off and running. The interesting thing on that one, um, there was some People did not leap to help quite as much, which later I, I, this is my own conjecture. There were four saloons in that, mm -hmm. four or five saloons in that row of buildings. And we had a strong temperance union in our town. And I think was, they were maybe not too sad to see some of them. I don't know, but there, there are actually comments that people did not jump in and help so much with that. Plus they just had a Thanksgiving dinner. Yes, that's right. They just had Thanksgiving. <laughs> Yeah, that actually happened with, in 1864, so that was 10 years before this fire. Oh, wow. Yeah, so those storefronts were underground at that time, and they had started building on top of that, but they were still allowing access to those underground storefronts simply because it was another spot for a business. Um, when I talk about, you know, different buildings, there are some businesses that ran underground all the time. I mean, you know, they have so they had windows for, and so they had to have openings for ventilation and then stairway access down. Just like going to the second floor, you didn't go inside up the stairs. There was an outside access to the second floor. No other way to get up there. So, very different building constructions. But but that that was all mostly underground by the time this happened. So those limestone storefronts are still there. Judy, didn't they break, didn't they break, they did a race, a race, we're having flooding issues. Yeah, yeah, that's why in 1864, well, actually, I've learned some new information on that, which tells me just how steep a grade. Uh, Guernsey was an engineer, and he wrote a very uh, detailed description about the grade of the street and why we had to raise the street. Um, and the bridge itself was a downhill bridge from the west side to the east side. So, so yeah, that, that was all before the fires. So, so. You had a question?
then later he had quite a debate with the mayor in the paper about <laughs> the fire department and what should be and, and things like that. So he was a local, uh, well-educated man and um, yeah, and the memoirs I found all are really fascinating and things that he experienced. So, so yeah, Dick Guernsey. Well, thank you so much for being here.